Hello and welcome to Axel Coral Live and we're delighted to be broadcasting to you from the Kamabi Research Station on Curaçao. Uh, now Curaçao is an island in the Southern Caribbean, part of the Dutch Caribbean and part of the ABC Islands with Aruba and Bonaire as well. And we're just off the coast of Venezuela so if you can situate us geographically that's where we are at the sort of tip of one end of the sea of the Caribbean. And we're at the Kamabi Research Station, which is a wonderful place situated close to the reef. And it does a couple of things. So it has uh, long-term research projects based here, as well as providing a home from home for visiting scientists. And those scientists can enjoy two things both the fantastic research facilities, so they have all the dry lab areas that they need uh, to process samples, analyze data, and use scientific equipment such as microscopes. Then there are also wet labs, and those are great for running experiments. And that's especially important if the researchers here want to isolate a particular factor that may be affecting the processes on the coral reef. Now it's a field research station, not just a research station, and that means that the scientists working here have great access to the field, and that's the science term we give to the great outdoors. And the field here is a coral reef, so come down, get your scuba gear, explore the wonders of coral, and perhaps if you're going even deeper, like today's, guests are experts uh, using the breather equipment to get even deeper on the reef. And with all that, just 50 metres offshore, the coral reef, an amazing abundance of diversity of life. We have just on the jetty here, brain coral, um, some feather worms, some Christmas tree worms, round the corner, a wonderful grove of elkhorn. And it's a simply spectacular place to be. And it's wonderful to have this uh, expert interview uh, with Pim, one of the researchers here at Kabawi. Welcome, Pim. And, thank you. And thank you so much uh, for being part of Coral Live. We're going to really want the, the students to sort of learn more from you, but we're just going to say he hello and find out who's watching. I'll get a chance to, to introduce great. yourself. Um, so we have schools from the USA, uh, Colombia, Canada, UK and Lithuania. Hi to all Hi. the students and classes watching. Um, we've got some special shout outs. Uh, so we've got a great class uh, coming to us again from, from Bogota in Colombia. And INEM school says thank you for giving us the opportunity to learn with you in the field. So a big hello to all the students there. Um, thank you uh, to Union Point Academy uh, for all the students' hard work in science and very really hard working students there in the US, a hi to everybody there, um, and hello to the Canadian students who are watching at Blessed Sacrament Catholic Elementary. Um, so wonderful to have you with us. Do remember, um, as for all Coral Live live lessons, uh, that you can submit shout outs and questions in advance via your Encounter Live section of your account. Um, Pim. Yes. Thank you. Hi, how Thanks are you? Thanks for having me. <laughs> Very well. Um, so we, we first met on as part of the Excel Catlin Seaview survey. You were part of, of uh, the Deep Reef team. You studied the Deep Reef. W what is the Deep Reef? Is, are we talking about the bottom of the ocean here? Because we've been talking a lot about the sort of like reef you see on postcards yeah. for, the, for, for much of coral life. Yeah, totally. No, so I studied deep reefs, but not those in the deep, deep ocean but basically the deeper health of tropical coral reefs as you find them here. So basically deeper than 30 to 50 meters depth. Because um, we know there, there's still reefs there. It doesn't just stop it. You know, whatever depth we can snorkel to, obviously. Yeah. And, and, and what's, what's uh, interesting or important about this deep reef? Um, that, that you study, and what, and what depths are we we'll be talking about here? Yeah, so this is this zone that we call the mesophotic zone, and it basically goes from 30 meters to about 100, 150 meters depth. Um, and what's special, on one hand, is that there is different types of corals that we don't get in the shallow, but there's also quite a few species that go from the shallow all the way to those depths. 
Um, and that's important because what we see is that a lot of stress stressors to reefs, you know, like whether it's the warming of the oceans or storm events, quite often have a much stronger effect in the shallow compared to the deep. And so we're very interested in these deeper reefs and how they might actually offer some sort of protection to corals. And, and this protection to the environmental changes that are happening on the shallow reef, is, is that something you, you've seen with your research? Yeah, so it's not, um, it, it's obviously complicated, but we do, we definitely have seen instances where, you know, the, the warming has a much greater effect in the shallow and the deeper you go, the less bleaching there is. Um, and say, yeah, same with storms too. So it's definitely, yeah. And, and I mean, I know there, was, there were papers coming out about to what extent uh, these deeper corals can help uh, recovery on the shallower reef if they're the same species. Yeah. Is, is that something that you're finding? Yeah, and basically what we're finding is that, like, if you obviously extend really deep into that zone, you get a very distinct community. So there's very different species that you find there compared to the shallow. Okay. And so that's not so much a refuge for the deep. But there's this sort of in-between zone if yep. you don't go too deep, but deep enough that it might escape such disturbances, that there actually might be a role um, for those reefs to, to help restore shallow reef areas. Amazing. And, and why is it, do you think, that um, there, there is less research on the deeper reef compared to the shallow reef? It's just because it's really difficult to go down to those depths. And so what you've seen in the past is that when people do have access to like fancy submersibles or remotely operated vehicles that you know you go as deep as you can because you're spending a lot of money to have these tools you want to you know <laughs> get your money's worth yeah. and so there's this in-between depth zone um, that we study but that's actually really been understudied over the past decades um. you talk about fancy technology and, and you're talking a little bit about submersibles but i can see behind you here uh something that that doesn't look um, like an ordinary sort of set of scuba, scuba gear. Yeah. So, so, I mean, this is what you use to go down and, and do your research. First of all, for, for those students watching who, who don't know about uh, normal scuba gear, could you briefly, I know we haven't got one here, but could you briefly describe what that does and then we can compare, yeah. it, compare it here? So with regular scuba gear, you would have a tank similar to this, but obviously much larger. Uh -huh. um, and what happens is that it basically provides you with air, so you breathe it in, but as soon as you breathe out, those bubbles just go into the uh, water and up and to the surface. And you often see on film or yeah, exactly. documentaries. Exactly. And so that will allow you to go to depths of you know up to 30 meters or up to you know 40 minutes to an hour um, but if you go deeper you need different tools and so that's why we use these rebreathers and why are they called rebreather it's basically it's the same we get air you know like you would get um, from a regular scuba tank but instead of breathing out and going into the ocean it's being captured here back again in the loop and it goes around and then what happens is that we actually have this um, a scrubber, which is on the other okay. side. I might actually show you. So it sits here. And so the gas goes through here and that actually takes out all the, the CO2, the carbon dioxide. It absorbs it in a reaction, chemical reaction. So what are those, those, those white chips or sort of, you know, coarse powder in there? Yeah, it's called soda lime. And so it reacts and it forms um, calcium carbonate actually. Ah. Um, and so that moves through, removes the CO2, and then we have these sensors in here and that actually measure the amount of oxygen. And so normally what happens, like in air, there's about 21% oxygen. But when you breathe out, there's still about 13 to 16% oxygen still there. And so this actually accurately measures that and then just injects bits of oxygen to get it back to the percentage we need. And that, that's from the green, the green tank. And that's the from the green cylinder. So this is the oxygen cylinder and this is sort of base, the base gas. So okay. What, 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 what's in here? Yeah, and so I'm saying gas instead yeah. of air, and that's because we don't breathe regular air, but we have something that we call trimix, which uh -huh. just like air consists out of oxygen, nitrogen, but it also has helium in there. Now that's not something we breathe in much of no. normally. So, so why have you got helium down at depth? Yeah, so we have the helium to replace some of the nitrogen. Because the problem with nitrogen is if you take that to great depths, it has a narcotic effect. So you start to feel a little bit drunk and that gets worse, worse the deeper you go. Um, yeah, some people talk about like a martini's law that with every 10 meters that you go deeper, it's the equivalent of drinking a glass of martini. Um, which, you know, obviously when you want to do science and when you want to stay safe, it's a bit of an issue. So we use the helium, replace that nitrogen, 
But then the other problem you have is that oxygen at great depths also becomes toxic. <laughs> and so that's another thing that we have to counter. And again, that's why we use helium to replace some of the oxygen so that we can you know, safely breathe this gas. And so, so you're breathing a mixture of oxygen, which is operated as well, the level of oxygen with your oxygen tank, helium and nitrogen. Uh, does that, does your voice change if you, so, if you breathe in? Yeah, you guess right. And Let's see if it's... I really want to, this is something I always... So yeah, this, uh, yeah. sorry, this cylinder is about 45% helium. 45%, um, okay. <laughs> And this is what it sounds like when you get helium and you <laughs> talk. So obviously you get a much higher voice, which, is, um, which sounds funny, but actually at depth when we're working, it's really helpful because with the higher vo voice, it's the high pitched voice, it's much easier to understand each other. Really? And also, because on regular scuba, it's really hard to talk. But here, because we actually have what we call counter lungs. So we have this enclosed volume of air or gas. Uh -huh and you can talk into it. So it's actually possible to talk on the water using these rebreathers. And, and do you just slip into a mode where high-pitched voices becomes normal? Do you, do you stop noticing after yeah. a while? I must admit, like the first couple of dives, people start, you know, <laughs> start giggling a bit because it is quite weird, yeah. but you get used to it. And, and yeah. so now, um, you have, you've been here for about a week now, is now yeah. already sort of like settled into... Yeah, yeah, settled in and... Yeah. And it's no longer, no longer a, sort of a laughing matter. Um, fant really, really interesting to hear about this. Uh, and in terms of science, what does this allow you to do underwater? Yeah. So the big thing is that basically with these small tanks, they allow us to stay on the water for five hours. And because you're rebreathing the, the gas, um, it doesn't matter, um, the depth doesn't matter. So it's five hours regardless of depth. Um, we obviously still have to decompress, so when we go to great depths, we have to slowly move to the surface. Um, why is that just out of interest? Yeah, it's because if we, um, if we go up too fast, we get the formation of bubbles um, inside, your, inside your blood, oh, right? That, that sounds your blood. good. And that's not good. No, so if you stay a certain amount of time at depth, you basically, the computer, you have a computer on your wrist and it tells you all the stops you have to make. Got to it. safely go to the surface without your yeah, blood bubbling up. Um, so it's obviously something that we have to really watch all the time and, and stick to. But basically, yeah, with this allows us to be in the water for five hours. A uh, regular dive that we do here, like yesterday, was about yeah. four hours. And that would allow us to go for like 25 minutes to 60 meters, half hour at 40 minutes, of uh, 40 meters, half hour at 20 meters. And so we can sort of wake our up, work our way up and keep working. And, and does it change the type of science that you can do by being able to spend such a long time underwater? Yeah, yeah, definitely. First of all, obviously, because it allows us to st spend way more time at, at these mesophotic depths. Um, and so before, when we just had ROVs or we were diving there, um, either time was limited because we were diving, or with ROVs, it's obviously long, much less... Um, it's good for just observing, but you, it's not like you can collect samples. So this allows okay. us to be like, be there in person, collect samples, and, and obviously like the amount of time that we can then spend that much time also working in the shallow, that's, it's great. Yeah. Perfect, and, and you, you talk about collecting samples and you talk about the analysis, the link between the field and the, res and the research here. Um, how, how do you go about collecting samples? Is, is that water samples or are you just taking bits of coral off the reef? What, what, what's, what's, yeah. what's, what's happening? So we're taking bits of, of the coral tissue, of the, the live animal tissue that sits on the coral skeleton. Uh -huh. And so how we do that is that we basically have a camera that's yep. sitting next to our mask and so it looks everywhere we look. We collect a bit of coral and then because we have these 3D models of the reef, we can later match up. Okay, this coral sits there in that plot. And then we have a tray on our bungee onto our arm that has tubes with numbers. Mm -hmm. And we basically scrape a bit of tissue off, put it in the tube, and that's how we can match that up. So you're taking very small amounts of coral tissue. Yeah. And then what, what, what happens to them from there? What, 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 what can you work out from just taking this coral tissue from, from different areas? Yeah, so we take that, that tissue, we put it in a buffer that will stabilize the DNA. And then we take it back to San Francisco where we are based. Um, and that's where we have the facilities to then extract the DNA and then sequence it. So we sequence the genomes of these corals or parts of the genomes. And it's to better understand um, why, you know, within a single species of corals, 
why they are so different and which genes are involved. And, and so that's the variation within a single species of yeah. coral. And do you find that the um, coral um, matters, um, the, the, the variation matters in terms of the resilience of the coral? Yeah. And so what we see at the moment, there's a, a mild bleaching going on. So there's actually warm temperatures. Mm -hmm. um, and what you see is that within this one plating coral species, half yeah. of the corals are bleached, but the other half aren't. Okay. And so we're trying to figure out what is it that makes those individuals different. Really? Yeah. And, and do, do, you, do you think that then that, that w will lead to an evolutionary change in, 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 the, in the genome of, of this, of this uh, species? Yeah. So when these corals... Um, if they would actually die off, because they bleach, but it doesn't yeah. necessarily mean that they will die. But if they die off, it basically means that the, the, the population changes, because all of a sudden those genotypes are not yeah. there anymore. Um, and so that results in changes in the population, which can be beneficial because the remaining population is more heat resistant. Yes. But maybe those same individuals are less resistant to like uh, a disease coming through. Uh -huh. yeah. So we'll, we'll, see, we'll see how it all, all, all balances out. Amazing. And, and so many more questions that I have, but I know that we've had a lot of questions sent, sent through and, and also on the live chat. So perhaps we can just have a, have a quick look um, here. Um, we've got from, from Bogota. Um, We've talked briefly about the connectivity um, from the shallow reef to the sort of uh, mesophotic reef. Yeah. Um, what other examples of connectivity um, in, in, on the coral reef does one find? Yeah, so we're using connectivity. So first of all, connectivity is basically, yeah, study how different populations are connected each other in terms of like how many larvae move back and forth between areas. And so it's a really important field of study to figure out, for example, whether marine protected areas, whether they can supply larvae to areas that are surrounding it and are maybe badly hit by some sort of um, disturbance. So it's not just in my specific example, I look at connectivity over depth, so between shallow and deep populations, mm -hmm. but people also look at to assess, yeah, marine protected areas. And okay, brilliant. So, so a really useful uh, science concept to be studying. Thank you very much for that question. Mm. Um, this next question is on scientific method, um, and it's asking how difficult is it to study DNA and other molecules in the ocean? Yeah, so studying DNA has been really difficult, especially in corals, for a long time. And partly it's because corals aren't just an animal, but they also have these algae, and they have all these bacteria living inside them. Okay. Um, and it makes it hard when you want to focus on just the DNA of the coral or the bacteria. But in saying that, um, we've seen a major revolution in these methods of sequencing. Okay. As you know, like we can sequence human genomes now in you know, a matter of an hour, basically. Yes. Um, and that same technology is helping us understand corals um, much, much better than we used to. Okay, brilliant. And um, I mean, it sounds very complicated. And it sounds also that probably getting samples is a little bit harder in the ocean uh, mm. than, it is, than it is on land. And you know, that, that really, and c c does that mean that the when you're studying terrestrial systems, do you, can you take a sort of like a, a field, you know, DNA sequencer with you? Is that a possibility? Yeah, I mean that's, but only since uh, since uh, it's only been a couple of years that okay. that's actually a reality. So that's the kind of technology that starts to emerge that we can actually take a sequencer um, and sequence the genome of a particular species and while you're in you the middle of the jungle. Or could you just have that one here? You could have that right here. Yeah. It's still a very, it's an expensive technology, so you would still pay, you know, a thousand dollars or something to sequence one individual coral. Oh, wow. So it's that not, yeah. you could do it, but, um, but the problem is also that we're looking at hundreds to thousands of individuals of corals to really okay. understand, right, these, yeah. these responses. So, so that's so. A, lot of, a lot of money for sequencing. Exactly, in, that's in still a, yeah, um, a while away. So why do you focus on the small stuff, Dr. Bongas? Why do I smoke? A <laughs> the small stuff. Why do I focus on the small stuff? Um, I mean, personally, I find coral very intriguing just because they are such crazy critters, right? It's an animal, it's an algae, it's a bacteria. It's that combination. So, from a biologist's point of view, it's a very, very interesting combination of organisms um, to study. So, I think that's what got me excited yeah. about these. Yeah. And uh, were you ever tempted at one point to be a sort of a fish biologist or was it always, or was it always a coral? I must admit that like in the beginning I was also really intrigued and was wanting to study fish but then the thing is with fish they swim away, right? <laughs> Most fish. 
cool <laughs> just sits there. And so it's actually, it makes it, you know, easier to study in, in that sense. Um, and again, like, I mean, it's very small stuff, but I mean, coral reefs, you can see from space, right? Yes. So even though they're very tiny, they have a, they're majorly important to our planet. Can I, can I ask something, which I've always, this is my own personal question, but I've always yeah. wanted to know. So we talk about all uh, corals being sessile, so they're sort of stuck to the bottom of yeah. the ocean. I've heard of mushroom coral. Mm. The exception, and how fast can they move? So how fast can they move? So. So these mushroom corals, the, what makes them different is that they're not attached. They're not yeah. attached to the reef substrate and they just often sit in the sand. And so we've actually been doing all these like time-lapse videos of mushroom corals. Really? And that shows that, yeah, within a day they can actually move, not super far, but they can... I mean, we're talking... Yeah, those kind of, like maybe something like this. Uh -huh. Yeah, and that's also because I always wondered when you're diving, quite often you see them turned over. And I thought, well, that must be it. That's when they die. But they can actually righten themselves. They can inflate themselves and just flip themselves back over. Very yeah. cool. Thank you for that. I've always, I've always, yeah, well, yeah. I've always wondered. Um, uh, had a lot of this um, on Coral Live this year, and I'm going to squeeze these two questions together. Uh, uh, two questions are: Are reef ecosystems coming to an end? Slash, can coral reefs adapt to climate change? Yeah. So obviously coral reefs aren't doing well. I mean, that's something that we see all over the newspapers and you know, to a large extent that's also in, in our own hands, right? It really is dependent on what we do now and the, the decisions we make. So reefs are going downhill, but they are still here and there's still some really amazing examples of reefs that have had a major disturbance. But then if we at least give them a chance by not, you know, um, subjecting them to any other stressors on yeah. top of what they've experienced and they can actually bounce back really well and I think that gives us a lot of hope um, as reef biologists. And, and just on that we've, we've had so many uh, questions about um, global warming and its impact on the, the reef ecosystem we've asked Rene yeah. um, to come and do the coral Q&A uh, tomorrow and actually yeah. just uh, talk through the mesocosm experiments yeah. um, on, on Heron Island looking at the twin impacts of um, ocean acidification and, and, and warming and to really go through some of the science and the basics and, and, and some of that data and he's gathering a whole set of papers at this, this afternoon uh, and this evening to, to, to look at um, what, what's going on. Yeah. Um, we're now going to Canada to Saskatchewan um, and <laughs> Noah, hi Noah, hey. uh, would like to know can fish talk to each other? Can fish talk to each other? Well, not like we do, right? Yeah. But um, they definitely make sounds. And I think there are certain species that probably do use that to communicate. But again, I'm not a, a fish biologist, but... Uh, but, but, but can uh, corals talk to each other? Can corals talk to each other? So not with sounds, but they can definitely release things um, that they can help to, for example, synchronize spawning or there's, so there's okay. definitely ways so, so the sort of chemical chat. Yeah, chemical chat. Yeah, it's chemical chat. <laughs> so, so releasing different chemicals into the water to synchronize spawning. Yeah. Um, to fight over space or exactly. say, hang on, this is my bit of reef. Yeah. Back off. Yeah. They, um, or I, I quite want to, to have your bit of reef um, and I'm coming to get you. I mean, these are the types of communication that we're getting on. The, exactly. <laughs> sorry to anthropomorphize yeah. corals yeah, a little yeah, bit, yeah. but you know, <laughs> yeah. but that's the kind of chemical signals perhaps, perhaps yeah. going on. Um, James would like to know, hi James, hey, James. Uh, would like to know, um, do you have a favorite type of coral? My favorite, I think the mushroom coral is my favorite type of coral, just oh, really? because it is like the fact that we have these little movies that you, where you see them moving around on the sea, but turning themselves over. That was just so amazing to see. Like it really makes it an animal. Uh, we'll, have, we'll have to find the links. Though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Are, are, there, are there an institute that's put them up? Can we? Can we yeah, yeah. YouTube? There's definitely some. Uh, yeah. Who will do, is there's a Lens of Time episode. Okay. Uh, where they have an interview and where I'm showing some of those videos. Oh, you're doing uh, that. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Cool. Yeah. We'll definitely find that and get that up on Twitter, if not the live chat um, today. Um, so, uh, do you think there is still more coral that we have not discovered yet? And that's from Isabel. Isabel. Yeah, I think there's a lot of coral that we haven't discovered yet. And at the moment, we're actually discovering lots of new species of corals. And partly that's because it's become so much easier to sequence corals, to sequence the genomes of them. And that's showing us that some of the corals that we thought 
where just a single species are actually yeah different so i think we might we might find way more corals than we currently have described. I because mean, what I find super interesting is this idea of what we get taught identification uh, when we're in our sort of grade whatever class, mm. um, at elementary or middle school. Uh, we use uh, keys. Um, we 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 look at shape. We look at color. Yeah. We look at. Uh, habitat where it's found uh, is, is that something that, that that coral scientists all do and then how how does the DNA part that you've been describing yeah does that replace the, the original characteristic method no. or does it complement it it complements it very much so and so I mean text what we call that taxonomy right okay. or systematics um, and so they have been doing a fantastic job at describing all the different coral species that we have but one of the major challenges that we have is that if you get a particular species that occurs over a large um, depth gradient, that when it grows in the shallow, it looks very different than when you find it at depth. Uh, okay. um, same as plants grow very different when they're on their high light or low light. But then obviously the challenge is often to figure out, do they look different just because that's what we call plasticity, they can grow differently depending on the environment, or is it because they're genetically distinct? And that's where genetics obviously helps us answer that question. And, and you found potentially some new, new species yourself. Yeah. And, 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 but they're, they're, in, they're in sort of pending. Yeah, they're pending. Um, and that's partly also because they're all species that we thought belong to this other species. Okay. And it's all species that we found in the deep that look distinct, but we always thought it's just because they grow differently in the deep. But it also makes it really challenging now to describe these species, because even though we know the genetics is different, you know, they still look very similar. And so it's finding and figuring out whether there is specific traits that make them different so that you could just tell by eye. And that's not always possible. And so it seems that we're at a tension point between saying, well, this is a different species because it looks different, it's a different color, it's a different whatever, yeah. or it's a different species because the the, the DNA is sufficiently is sufficiently sort of different between the, these these two examples. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Do you think do you think it will always be that tension or, or one? No, one I out? think I mean it's all combined, and it's not just what it looks like and what the genetics are, but it's also what's the, the what we call the ecology of the species, right? Like where do they occur? Uh, what kind of conditions can they do? What what's their physiology like? Um, and so we try to sort of integrate all these different aspects. Brilliant. Um, we're going to go, go and get you sort of uh, what is the scariest moment you've had diving, and that is from Emma, um, who is in Saskatchewan. So the scariest moment I think was actually here in Curacao, maybe about 10 years ago, and we were diving and we had done a deep dive and we we're doing decompression, and we had the boat sitting above us, um, and all of a sudden we heard a big snap. And then we looked up and the boat was gone, drifting off. And at that time, we didn't actually have someone sitting in the boat, which wasn't a very wise decision. We do that very differently these days. Um, but we did have an issue because we had to stay underwater because we still had to complete our decompression. And we knew that in the meanwhile, that boat was just floating off into the distance. So yeah, it all worked out. We actually ended up going to the surface. And then one of our colleagues was working in the next bay with another boat. And so they were towing that boat behind. So they found the drifting they found boat. It. And, and all ended well, but big team. lesson learned. Big lesson learned. Need someone on the boat. Um, this is an awesome question uh, from Ava. Uh, Ava, I think you, you, you're, you're up there with winning the question of Coral Live so far. Okay. <laughs> I'm very curious about that one. Pim, we're going to we'll give you a, a promotion. OK. Um, you are, are now president. Yeah of the world yeah and you can make one law to protect the ocean what would it be one law i think completely cutting out fossil fuels i think that's the main the main change that we need to see and soon if we really still want to make an impact okay there we go president pym has spoken. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant that is a really really great question ava yeah it um, is um and then billy would like to know if you are going to be anything other than a scientist what would you be? I think, um, other than a scientist, I think, you know, being in management. So trying to help manage uh, coral reefs and trying so that's to... that's not business management. Bus yeah, no, exactly. But reef yeah, management. Reef management. So sitting, 
you know, trying to translate what the science is doing to politics, I guess, and trying to reinforce that. So, yeah. You know, Brilliant, and mainly by cutting out fossil fuel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've got some uh, live questions coming through. Um, uh, Jan Mark um, from Blessed Sacrament School um, in Ontario would like to know, uh, where does the colour on coral reefs come from? Yeah, where does the colour come from? So it's a combination. So a lot of times when people think about coral reefs, they think about greens, blues, yellows, like crazy colors, because that's what it, they often show in documentaries. But the, the most prominent color on reefs because of coral is brown, and that's because of the chlorophyll they have. So that's sort of the base color. And then it's true that you every now and then see these very bright green or bright blue corals, and that's because of their, um, their protective pigments. So they, especially in the shallow, they have all these crazy colors, um, and they're basically sort of sunscreen pigments, so they help them protect them against the UV radiation. And, and I mean, it's important to point out when we, when we talk about the, the color of the coral reef, it's not just coral um, that we're seeing, there's all types of other yeah. animals. Uh, it might be uh, encrusting, that red encrusting algae. Yeah. It, it could be, I mean, I know the, the sponges are so often yeah. quite brilliant, yeah. brilliant colors. So, uh, and I should, should have asked Jasper and Ben this, and I don't know whether this is, uh, this is the sponge researchers here. Why, why are sponges so bright? Or bright red. I don't know. I don't know. Well, I get often asked the same questions, like especially on the deep reef, you have a lot of octo, it's like um, gorgonians, like fan corals, yes. and they've got the most bright colors, and they're all very different. It's like, why do they have those colors? But it, it, we don't really know, I think. Really? Like, okay. Yeah. So there we go. Um, yeah, Mark, uh, uh, you've got um, a few years to finish school. Please figure uh, it out. <laughs> finish school and then, then your undergraduate degree and then your master's uh, doctorate on, on the, the reason for colourful Gorgonian sea fans yeah. uh, on the twilight zone of our reefs. I would love to know. Wow, that's a great, that's a great title. <laughs> um, so, um, we have, um, does a specific uh, species feed on coral? What eats coral? So there's a whole lot of fish that actually feed on coral. Yep. Yeah. So like butterfly fish, they have these special snouts that actually allow them to uh, to eat coral polyps. Uh, parrot fish, they they're actually herbivores and they feed on algae, but they also bite into the coral, and they actually munch up the coral and produce all the sand um, really? that we get on the beaches here. So you're basically uh, holidaying on on parrotfish. Poop. Parrotfish poop. That's okay. right. Yeah. Right. That's <laughs> brilliant. Um, Action um, would like to know. Could coral ever grow on land, or is it only found in the ocean? Yeah, so it never could completely grow on land, just on land. But what we do see, for example, in Australia, where it spent quite a bit of time, there's a big tidal differences. Uh -huh. And there you have coral that actually spend a large part of their day out of the water. Um, so they can definitely be out of the water for a while, and they protect themselves with a sort of mucus coat. Uh, but eventually they need to be back in the water. They wouldn't be able to survive just out of so, so not, not, not full time? No. Brilliant. Uh, next question coming up. We have, um, what would happen were there to be no more coral reef or were the, you know, the, the, all the corals to die? So if that would be very, very sad, first of all. Um, and be very sad because there's about 500 million people on this planet that depend on coral reefs um, for their livelihoods. Okay. So, and in different forms and shapes, right? Like whether it's fisheries and they feed on it, whether it's tourism. Um, the other part is that coral reefs obviously are very important in protecting coastlines as, as a natural barrier. So that's another thing. If, if corals were to completely die, the, the reef structure would slowly erode away and you would lose that protection. So. And, and in terms of supporting the biodiversity of our oceans, what, yeah. what role do coral reefs play there? A, a huge role, yeah. I mean, 25% of marine biodiversity occurs on coral reefs. And so they're all so strongly interdependent. If we would lose the corals, the structure, we would slowly start to lose the fish and all the others, the sponges, the right? Like, it's all connected. I know, and, I, and I, when I reflect on this, I mean, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a deep sadness to think that an entire sort of ecosystem um, there is no, there is no future in its present state for it. Yeah. Um, but also that you know we're, we're talking about um, 
in some ways ecosystem goods and services. Yeah. And that's, I think it's quite an important term. It's not written into many curricula yet, but it's maybe a term that classes can start to explore um, how nature supports us as much as how uh, you know, we, we, we affect nature. So we've, we've talked about some of those, you know, it gives us mm. uh, food, it gives us jobs, it gives us mm. storm protection. And it's one I'm very keen, actually. I think if I if I were president, I think it's compuls almost a compulsory course on eco ecosystem goods and services at school. Yeah, but probably more than that. Um, so my in my phone is, is delighted by, but I've just got it working again. Um, Jan Mark would like to know how long you've studied corals. How long? Now, but so 15 years ago, I think I started studying. Um, so I started my degree, started, started actually with terrestrial biology, tropical okay. rainforest, and then went into marine biology, uh, yeah. Um, we're, we're, we're going, um, so we, we talked about 25% of all marine species being supported by, by the reef. Um, Deborah would like to know, how is that? How, how do different animals depend on the reef? Yeah, so how different animals depend on the reef? Like for example, corals. They obviously provide the structure, like fish need a place to hide, right? Or a lot of species of fish do. And so they provide that structure where uh, fish can hide. Um, on the other hand, um, there's sponges that, you know, there's certain fish that only can live like inside the sponge. Like there's all these interesting relationships where they're all dependent on each other. And and, and so there's feeding relationships, there's probably shelter from predators. And yeah. There's, I mean, uh, one of the things I found interesting, um, I think, when, when working um, in Timor Leste, was people describing how different life stages of a fish mm. sometimes came through through a reef or, or, or not. Yeah, exactly. And so you have certain species that actually move to the mangrove. So we've got some large mangrove okay. areas here, and the juvenile fishes are there. And then, then where they're big enough, they actually move on to the reef, and so they. Oh, yeah. Okay, that's pretty cool. Um, Sydney, and I love this. Have you ever been scared about diving into the unknown? In diving into the unknown? Well, definitely sometimes, especially on these deeper dives, it can definitely be spooky sometimes because it's obviously much darker down there. And then sometimes you're sort of swimming to the edge of a ledge and you're not quite sure what's behind it. And then you get sharks moving past and it definitely gets a bit spooky sometimes. And, and, and when, when you do you ever have to hold on to the reef or, or, or rocks and do you worry what something might sort of come out of a, a crevice or something? Yeah, yeah. And we obviously have to be very careful because every now and then we do have to put our hands down. And so we obviously make sure that we don't put it on top of a coral or... But the problem, there's all these different fish, like stonefish, they are so well camouflaged, but you definitely don't want to put your hand on them. So we we have to be very careful, uh, yeah. Uh, sounds like beautiful, but slightly scary at the same time. Yeah, well, the, yeah, there's definitely an excitement uh, factor there. Um, uh, Nick, who's being homeschooled in, in London, um, do you ever find two species of coral in the same sample? Like, is, is there such close proximity of different coral species that you can pick a sample and actually it turns out you've got two, two in one go. Yeah, well, especially because there's, so you have this thing called chimeras, where there's actually, when you get two different corals, uh -huh. but they're similar enough. Often they are the same species, but different um, genotypes, and they come very close to each other, and then they fuse, and they become a single coral. And so okay. sometimes a coral is like half green, half brown, uh -huh. and it's actually from two different original corals that have fused into one. So and so you, that's where sometimes really weird because then you sequence a coral like that and then you get very weird results obviously because you know it's two different individuals but that's why uh, yeah so, uh, an amazing question I, i've never heard heard that before that's yeah great. The chimera was it chimera yeah and that that's a mythical beast made from different animals exactly fantastic um uh, in surrey um from the uk we have what is the longest you have ever spent underwater the longest i think is four and a half hours yeah so i never mixed out the five hours that we can get on the rebreather you don't want to kind of max out you will probably four and a half, yeah that was long enough then. um so um we're going back to blessed sacrament school uh deborah do coral reef give off bacteria sorry do, do coral, coral reefs give off bacteria give off bacteria yeah they give off lots of bacteria yeah 
So there's obviously lots of bacteria living inside of corals and they're very important. In fact, they couldn't do without them. Like us, we have all these bacteria, yep. right? In our guts, they're extremely important. Uh, but they also, yeah, they shed that off. Corals often, they have this sort of mucus layer on top of them and that, that allows them to get rid, to shed bacteria actually. Okay. And so that mucus is always, yeah, completely covered in bacteria. Brilliant, Deborah would also like to know, um, We've seen a lot of plastic pollution in, in the news. Yeah. How does, how does, or how can uh, plastic pollution affect uh, the reef? Yeah. So we do actually see more and more plastic pollution on the reef, and it can be a real problem. And it's specifically a problem for like animals, like turtles or fish, that will mistake that food, that plastic for food. And so that's one ma of the major issues. But people have also done experiments with like microplastics yeah. and trying to see if corals actually ingest them. And those initial experiments show that they are actually ingesting them. So we're still trying to figure out exactly what the... I mean, I've, I've heard, I mean, and, and I don't know whether this is true or not, that, that in some cases, if you get large pieces of plastic, it can block the sunlight from getting to... Yeah corals and so they're not accessing exactly. that energy yeah and also a, a, a research paper i think that was on how um plastic can transport disease yeah and it affects coral more easily because exactly. it's, sort of, it's more buoyant on o ocean currents yeah it's quite because yeah no definitely definitely and the, the i mean and that's the thing with diving to the, the depths that we dive to is that it's just amazing that even at those depths we find so much plastic there yeah um yeah and, and the whole class in Ontario, and, and I imagine classes um, around the world watching, is, is we talk about all these issues, w what can they do? What can they do? I mean, I think, and that's, that's a question that we obviously get asked a lot. Um, I think really the responsibility to protect reefs isn't just for the people that live right next to them, right? Because what are the major stressors? What are the major problems we call is global climate change. And that's, you know, that's all our responsibility, you know. And I think on one hand, it's being very, you know, loud about, you know, the changes we need to make or that politicians need to make. But also like yourself as a, you know, as we call it, like as a consumer, like yep. be critical about the things you eat, you buy, yep. because all of that makes a difference. Uh, okay, so really looking at carbon emissions and, and potentially, depending on what stage of your learning you're at, just, just learn more and, and share as yeah. well. Because it's it's very easy i think sometimes to ignore uh habitats that are far from where you live yeah oh, and especially ones that are underwater and, and, and hard exactly hard to see. yeah uh, and the actions that you take um to help the the coral reef are likely to be those same actions you would take to protect habitats and environments near your school mm. uh, so it doesn't necessarily have to be something that's sort of different or separate yeah um so so mm. great um, to have all this interest in, in um, protecting the reef for the future. Uh, Asher would like to know, um, oh, sorry, we've skipped a couple. Um, from, from Austin, Texas, uh, what did you be uh, when you were a kid? What's that? What I wanted to be as a kid? Yeah, what did you want to be when you grew up? I don't know, I think it changed a lot from the, the usual fireman to like... <laughs> I, I wasn't, yeah, as a kid I wasn't like, I'm going to be a marine biologist when no. I'm old, or I'm going to be a scientist when I'm old, yeah. Uh, I, I probably had, yeah, being a soldier like my, my, soldier? my, my, my father, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, you would want to be like your dad, you know, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, uh, this is J Jamie and Pim, who is your biggest role model and why? Well, who's yours? I'm um, going to go either for uh, Jane, I'm probably going to go for Jane Goodall. I was going to say the same. I'm serious. Really? Yeah. yeah. Why? Why? What? What? What's, what impresses you so much about about uh, Jane's work and, and life? Yeah. So for me, especially when I was younger, as I said, I was first. I started off with Rainforest. So obviously, there the link is a bit closer yeah. with Jane Goodall. But what I really like is that she always had a message of hope, right? Like it's yeah. always this this positive message rather than just sitting down and you know taking things for what they are, but positive well, change. And I love the way that she, you know, she she didn't she couldn't get into university. She went out to field yeah. research anyway she was then invited and helped and supported uh and then i love i love you know from an education background i, I love the fact that you know 
one of her greatest legacies, not only in our understanding of, of chimpanzees and, and yeah. their environment, is Roots and Shoots, yeah. um, the education and, and youth program. So, yeah. so that that though, yeah. really, you know, great science, great inspiration, great hope, yeah. um, and great role model. Yeah. yeah. Learn more about Jane. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, from uh, we've got ah, we're, we're nearly out of time. So, um, sort of very short answers to. Yeah. Asher would like to know why is it important to regenerate coral or for coral to regenerate? Just to give it an extra helping hand, basically. Yeah, to kickstart that process. Yeah. Uh, what's the weirdest coral you've ever seen? The weirdest yeah. coral? Ooh, I think some of the crazy fire corals you get sometimes, the weird shapes they have. And, yeah. and, and not good to touch them. Not good to touch them. Um, and last but by no means least, we've got Nick uh, in London and Divine in Ontario. We'd like to know. Um, how do coral reproduce? How do corals reproduce? So quickly, obviously, because yep. I think we're running out of time. Two main ways, but there's a lot of in between, a lot of gray area. But they either release sperm and eggs, goes to the surface, fertilizes, and then after a couple of days, larvae form swim back. And you have other species that are brooders that actually keep the eggs inside, but the neighboring colonies release sperm. They internally fertilize and then they leave, um, produce larvae that can just swim away straight away. And then we have budding, where they reproduce just by dividing and cloning themselves. Exactly. So we've got a whole session uh, with Kristen tomorrow. And she knows all about it. Uh, and we'll get some under the microscope for you as well. Um, so do tune in same time tomorrow uh, for US audiences. We've got that also earlier um, in the day as well. Tim, thank you so, so much no, uh, thank for you. being part of Coral Live. It's, it's great to see you again out here in Curacao. Um, and uh, thank you so much to thank all you. those amazing questions from you guys. Um, we're, 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 we're working towards picking our question uh, of Coral Live, and we might be a bit, a bit, a bit closer um, today. Thank you, and until tomorrow, we've got a great lineup of speakers. We've got Kristen, we've got looking at uh, shark adaptation, uh, with a little live investigation, and we've got a QA and a uh, with uh, Rene, who's going to take us through, uh, in a bit more detail, the science of the impact of climate change on coral reefs. Until then, bye-bye from Curacao, and bye-bye from Coral Live. Bye!